This program features live coverage of an African safari and may include animal kills and carcasses. Viewer discretion is advised. This is why the Nkunguma Pride is such a firm favourite. It's Kinky Tail. He just looks ready for a fight. This is still her territory. The Evoker boys are here to stay. Ooh. How insane was that? Good afternoon, everybody, and welcome to another episode of Safari Lives, coming to you live from Juma Game Reserve in the Sabi Sands, where my name is Steve. I'm joined by Senzom Kize on camera, and of course, we are outside by the tent, taking in a few of the afternoon rays. It is a beautiful day, and we would love to hear from you. You know how to on hashtag Safari Live, or throw your questions in on the YouTube chat stream. Now, for this afternoon, uh, we have got some highlights and some lowlights, of course, and we're going to talk about and discuss the elements of camouflage in the African wilderness. And by doing that, we need to first of all understand exactly what ethology is. And now ethology is essentially the study of animals in their natural habitat, the behavior. Study of animal behavior in their natural habitat. Now, that is looking at behavior natural and habitat. So very, very interesting indeed how animals have evolved evolutionary to live out here, to survive, uh, to, to hunt, to avoid predation, to look after their youngsters all the same time. And obviously as this goes along in the environment, it gets better and better and better. As the predator gets stronger, the, the prey animal gets better at hiding. So we're going to look at a few of the protective behaviors, uh, but we're going to mainly look at disruptive coloration and camouflage. There's also such things as thanatosis, uh, aposomatic coloration, armor, startle displays, distraction displays, and a couple more such as mimicry. Uh, we're going to go through all of those, but mainly focusing on camouflage and the evolutionary adaptations with many, many examples. But as always, it is not only me out here in the African wilderness. Jamie Patterson would like to say good afternoon. A good afternoon to you all and welcome to another episode of Safari Lives where the animals have decided to play along with our theme this afternoon. My name is Jamie and behind the camera is Darby and he is desperately trying to film a zebra which is doing a fantastic job of giving us an example of how it coats or its coat actually acts as disruptive coloration something that i imagine that steve will be chatting about in quite a bit of depth as we go on impala of course one of the most successful species oh, yes chase that bird you chase that bird now what i don't know what that was all about it is rutting season that's what it was all about that was impala ram number two who has shown off his rival and as I said, one of the most successful species, even though the males at this time of year could be described as both a successful and phenomenally vulnerable, as distracted as they are by the presence of ladies and, of course, incredibly heightened testosterone levels, passing on those immensely muscular necks, which actually increase in size by around about a fifth or so. Oh, there runs a lady. You missed her. There's another one coming, I'm sure. No, it was just that lady. She's gone. Oh, yeah, yep. Yeah, okay. Better go and investigate. No, but there's more ladies off behind you. What to do? Because that one female went straight towards your rival. Now what? Cut one's losses and go back to defend the rest of the group or stand here in the middle of the road looking a bit silly. Well, I think we have our answer. No, wait, are we going back to the ladies or what to do? He does not want to lose even one female as a mating opportunity. Now, while the antics of the Impala keep us very entertained, you're going to be entertained by Tristan, who is probably not scampering quite as athletically as these Impala. 
Well, indeed, the Impala, I suppose, hopefully will entertain Jamie more by starting to shout and make a bit of a noise for potentially some sort of predator. But it is a very good afternoon, and it's crazy to think that we're on episode 51 of Safari Lives, which amazes me in many respects. As you can see, we are out on a bushwalk, and as you can also see, Jamie lets you know who I am. My name is Tristan on camera. I've got Sebastian this afternoon. And the plan for the afternoon, given that it is Safari Lives and a focus on... Um, all of our characters that we see, as well as we're going to be doing a bit of camouflage. So we're going to try and see if we can fit both of those things into our bushwalk. We'll look maybe for some insects that are camouflaged, as well as maybe potentially any sign of our cats as we go. Now, I must apologize before we kind of get too much into our walk, is that if you hear me sniffing or short of breath, is because I'm a little bit under the weather. And so it's sometimes a little bit tricky to be able to speak for long periods now. Herbie has managed to find what can only be described as remnants of what... Did you say hello, Herbie? <laughs> there we go, you did say hello. So what we've got here is essentially a very dried out piece of impala fur. I'm not going to pick it up because there's probably all kinds of horrible bacteria all over this. Um, this would have been basically dragged here by hyenas. It comes off the carcass, the same one that Tandi was chewing on during the course of the week. She had an impala head that she was chewing on, and I'm pretty sure this comes off that exact same carcass because it's very close to where I had her. But what you can see is that it is really quite dry. I'm, I was trying to find a stick maybe. That, there we go, there's a stick. I don't know if it's going to be big enough to be. But if you look, you can see this is no longer soft anymore. It's basically turning out like a dried piece of leather. So over the course of the last five, six days, or however long it's been here, it's between the sun and the cold, it's basically dried it and stiffened it out completely. Now, this won't be really eaten by anything in this state, but if we get a bit of rain or heavy dew that will settle in the next few days, what will happen is that this will soften up a little bit and it will start to smell. And then you're going to find things like hyenas, potentially even leopard or lions, um, coming in here and they'll pick this up and they'll actually chew it and kind of eat it again. It's not really nutritious, but the smell and the kind of um, consistency of it will be something that they would love to go after. So you'll find that they um, will chew that if it gets wet again and softens. If it stays like that, probably not. Unless, of course, one of the hyena, young hyenas comes across it. So... Sinak know that it cannot be regurgitated by the leopards or lions. Um, too big, firstly, and, and flappy. Um, that particular piece of meat, I actually saw it a few weeks ago, and it was just lying there, and it was, well, not a few weeks ago, a few days ago. Um, and it was still loose and kind of flexible. Um, so, And you can also see on that particular piece is that there is actually hair on the skin itself. If that had gone through the digestive tract, it would have been chewed up a lot more. The hair would have been kind of missing in places and would have been stripped in other places. So really not something as complete as that would have come out the rear end or been regurgitated by a lion or a leopard. Um, also, you'll find lion and leopards very seldom will eat that like that because they don't like the fur and it's very difficult to digest. And so they rather lick and try and groom that hair off before they actually eat the skin. So, no, it's not a regurgitation. That's just been dragged there by hyenas and been left there to decay. And I'm sure something will eventually eat it as it gets moist after the sort of um, dew that we do get in the winter months. Good. We're going to head southwards. We're going to be trying to see if we can find any signs of the little chief. And while we do that, let's send you across to Pat, who I think is also in the southern boundary. And he looks for the little princess. Well, it's actually a very, very fitting theme camouflage for this episode because, well, we just had a whole heap of kudu in Impala right there and well, they have eluded us. They have gone off into the thickets and are no longer to be seen. So my name is Patrick. Joining me behind the camera is Owen and we are coming to you from the Juma Game Reserve here on the western side of the Great Kruger National Park. And if you have any questions throughout this live interactive drive, please do send them in using the hashtag Safari Live on Twitter or the YouTube chat stream. So just quickly, just so you know, I wasn't lying to you all. Here are the Impala that we did stumble upon. And, well, we can see that their fawn colour is very, very similar to that of the grass. And that's a form of camouflage really 
helps them blend into the environment. Well, especially this time of year when everything's kind of dying off and going a bit orange, they hide away very well in the thickets as we can see at this one moving through there. Camouflage quite well. But moving on, I am looking for something else that camouflages very well in this grass this time of year, and that is leopards. So we were just on the tail of Tralumba. We missed her by her little princess whiskers. Oh, here's some nice kudu up ahead of us. Uh, she was just down near Treehouse Dams, down near the south here, and she unfortunately, just before we arrived there, crossed the southern border where we do not have traversing. And unfortunately, she has evaded us, but not to worry, there's still other leopards to look for, but let's, uh, looks like this kudu, if this is a female in front of it, let's see if it pokes out the other side here. Yes, I think we're gonna have some mating here. It definitely looks interested, and I know that this is the time of year. To, I'll just see if I can, oh, I don't want to interrupt here, but I also want to get a better angle than what we have right now. Uh, <laughs> his horns got in the way. Those kudu horns really do look quite tedious to carry around, especially when you're trying to chase a female. And they do camouflage quite well. Someone else who wants to chat to you all about camouflage is Steve, who is in the tent. Well, thanks, Pat. Indeed, looking at your kudus there, um, camouflage is the quintessential way that they deal with survival or with predators out in the natural world. And, you know, camouflage is one of the oldest and most primitive and easiest ways of animals to sort of avoid predation, uh, to conceal themselves, to conserve energy as well, to conceal their young. And there are many, many adaptations out there in the wilderness of animals using camouflage to sort of just make their life a lot easier. Uh, kudu, for example, we're going to discuss it shortly in some clips. We've got lots of clips to discuss. We're going to do some insects, um, some animals, including cats, of course, and kudus, and um, something else right at the end. So, I mean, camouflage being very primitive, we've got insects who probably first started off with camouflage, then through to frogs and reptiles, and we said chameleons as well, and then birds and mammals have taken on that as well. So by camouflaging yourself, you have a better chance of surviving. Um, you can either avoid predation through what we call the freeze and flight sort of strategy. Uh, kudu, you've seen how big their ears are. I don't want to get too much into kudu, but essentially they can run short distance and they stand very still. They disappear in the thickets. So essentially means that a predator needs to develop some form of search image to be able to see that animal moving in those thickets and then to be able to catch them. And we see it very, very often animals run away and they just even pat there with nice color vision, lost sight of kudu that just disappeared behind the bush. Now, when we talk about camouflage, it's also very important to understand the habitat and the habitat availability and the diversity because some animals will camouflage well in some environments and then go to another one and it just doesn't work. So over a very long period of time, animals have capitalized on the area that they're in. So just a very sort of classic example of what we see on the African plains right here is some zebra and some uh, giraffe doing what they do. And some springbok, I think, in the background there. And uh, this is sort of the quintessential African sort of scenario, isn't it, with all these different animals. And we're going to try and get through a few of these. But obviously, we're going to start off first with a clip from uh, some insects, just to give you a little idea of how the insects move and how they do their thing. So I'm going to open the first clip on insects, and I hope you are ready to see how well these mantises are able to camouflage themselves. So just push play over there, and you'll see how we zoom in there. Where is it? Where is it? There it is. Okay, so as we look at the mantis, I'm just going to push pause over there because I've just put on the clip praying mantis on the branch. It is quite incredible how much of a stick like this creature looks like. Now, seeing as it's paused, it's very hard for you to actually see where this creature is unless it moves. And essentially, essentially the way that camouflage works is that you can be camouflaged, but you need to move very, very slowly. If you move around, it's a very obvious way of something being able to see you. But if you're able to sit very, very still on a branch, for example, just like this praying mantis, we're going to push pause again or play again. See how it's moving? It's very obvious to see. But if it wants to stand still, 
There we go. And stand still again. And that's when its ambush strategy works very, very well. So this is just one type of praying mantis. And then a second one on the ground, as I said, many different types of habitats, much diversity, many insects evolving in many different types of habitat. This one being more on the ground, looking a little bit more like grass, where the other one looks a lot more like a stick, but very much the same strategy. You can see that this mantis is there on the grass. It almost looks like a blade of grass. No bird would be able to see that the search image let me just push pause there before we get to the next one the search image required for bird to see that praying mantis would actually be quite quite a lot they'd have to really really work to see the stick that just stands there like this but if it moves and we see lilac breasted rollers uh, birds like that that sit and wait and that's why we get a lot of these animals moving through fields and you see forks or jongos and egrets following buffalo following all sorts of animals because as those insects that are camouflaged move they get that ability to see them they go down and they grab them but when they stand still completely invisible so with the praying mantis it's not just a concealment from predation it's also ambush and ability to catch food as we'll see now with this mantis just push pause again one of our eye fl flower eye mantids this is one of the nymphs sitting on the wolthoria wolthoria and they sit and you know i was talking earlier let me just push pause again we're talking about habitat and preference of diversity and the important thing of habitat and diversity, and you look in any book, um, a mammal book or an insect book, and you look under habitat or biology, it'll actually tell you where that animal occurs. And the flower mantids actually mimic flowers. They mimic the plant that they're on. Uh, this particular flower mantid couldn't just be sitting on that stick like that other mantis was. Uh, it would just be very visible there. So they sit in an area, a habitat that's very specific to them. And sometimes that habitat is so small scale that they evolved to look exactly like a particular flower on a particular tree, nowhere else. So by doing that, they can wait, just ambush. So first of all, We'll just push play again they avoid being detected by predators and then once again they also are able to catch food that comes close and i'll see if you can spot it i'm going to push pause there we'll see if you can see this insect can you see it don't forget we are live everybody we'd love to hear your questions and comments now we're looking at a crested a female crested locust here and um if you can't see it, I'll have to play it a little bit forward for you to see it moving. And this thing actually mimics the ground. It mimics the vegetation on the ground. Uh, some of them actually mimic stones. And you can just see on the right, there we go. It's moving its feelers. And there we go, much better example. So, so well camouflaged to avoid predation, to avoid being detected. Um, this grasshopper locust is not a predator. It is a grass eater, an organic material eater. So it's moving around feeding. But while it's feeding, doesn't want anybody to see it so the camouflage that it's created there is a form of sort of mimicry that's blending itself right in with the ground which i think is fantastic which we'll is push play again in you want to know how many types of mantis there are i really have no idea i can certainly tell you there's more than 10 definitely more than 10 I don't know even in a book that I've got like this the element of or the amount of insects in a book insect book that I've got is only a fraction of what is out there we really have no idea how many insects there are in the world how many species are still being unidentified and every day who could be finding there's always still chance of finding identifying new species so off the top of my head i can't tell you i might have to read up on that in a moment to find out exactly how many but one more part of the insects that we're looking at now and this is another mantis i'm just going to push play thank you very much google i'm just going to push pause there google says 2600 species of mantis now that is a lot okay so now we've got a bird dropping mantis now that mantis i'm just pushed pause sitting there on the branch on the leaf itself it looks like a bird poo doesn't it now we've got a very good example of it sitting there from an angle and if i just rewind it very slightly here You'll actually see, if I go back just a little bit, you'll see that there's just this little white speck over here on the leaf. It doesn't look like food. It doesn't look like anything, really. It looks like a, a piece of a leaf or a branch that's underneath a tree where a bird has been roosting, and it looks like a bird has defecated. So hence the name uh, bird dropping. 
So I think that is a fantastic example of, of mimicry. And hey, how would you like to mimic a piece of poo? Very good. Very good. So these are just a few examples of insects that we got that are basically mimicking um, their environment. They are camouflaging in to either avoid predation or to... So to either mimic their environment or to mimic something to avoid either being eaten or to be able to sneak up on something nearby. But anyway, while we try and get ready for the next little bit of excitement, let's go on down to Jamie and see how she's getting on on her search. All right, well, Steve gathers his insects all in a row. Our zebras have gathered or had gathered nicely in a row as well. And I'm sitting with them, and I have been for a considerable period of time just because we have not seen zebra in so long. I cannot think of the last time I was able to show you a zebra on one of our live safaris. The reason is why we, or the reason why we're here is because I've actually come out in search of any sign of the Inkuhum and they were reported to have crossed towards Sydney's dam. So we're right up in the sort of the top northwestern corner of Juma. And instead of finding a pride of lions, we found ourselves a herd of zebra all gathered together looking decidedly antsy. And I suspect the reason behind that is because I think this is actually a bachelor group. I don't think that this is a, a male with a harem or a group of ladies. I think this is a group of males who are looking for that opportunity to earn themselves their first mating rights. That's what I think we have here. And of course, oh, look at that. Perfect example. Beautiful. Burn that image into your minds. Steve's going to talk about it later. Ah, now Balto knows that there are different species of zebra and wants to know what species of zebra these are. The answer to that is that they are plains zebra. I grew up knowing them as Birchall zebra, but they are in fact plains zebra. We also in South Africa will get mountain zebras, but not in this particular area. One big giveaway for us here in South Africa is the shadow stripes, and that's a perfect example. Between the bold, dark stripes on that zebra's rump, you can see an area where it looks as though somebody ran out of ink while they were painting on the zebra's stripes, and they just kind of had left too big of a gap, so they quickly filled it. Those are the shadow stripes. Interestingly enough, the same species of zebra that you find in the, in the Maasai Mara, it's the same species, but they don't have those shadow stripes nearly as often as the plain zebra do here. Another dead giveaway, well, only a really a dead giveaway, if you know what you're looking for, is the stripes extending all the way down underneath the belly and all the way down the legs as well. Each and every single one of these zebra has a unique spat spatten, a unique spatten of tripes, a unique pattern of stripes. No. Interestingly enough, Miss Addo wants to know if a leopard has ever caught a zebra. I said no. My, what I meant to say was yes, so, but clearly speech is not working out terribly well for me this afternoon. It's entirely possible for a leopard like Hosanna, Tingana, one of the larger male leopards uh, to catch a zebra foal. I actually wouldn't even put it past a leopard like Tundi. She's a truly powerful cat and she's been known to kill female waterbuck, which is enormously past her weight range. And I also suspect that Seboya might be up to the challenge, although to be honest, I'm not a hundred percent sure. She certainly, the other day, didn't feel up to the challenge of hoisting up 70 kilograms worth of impala. Pretty Sabui returned to us once again this week, this time back further into the centre of her territory. Perhaps she is a leopard of tactics and didn't want to push Tundi too far too soon. Softly, softly, gently, gently, and all that. Every single leopard in the Sabi sand has been taking advantage of the impala rut over the last few weeks 
and Sibui was no exception. The thing about the Impala rut, though, is that the victims tend to be on the heavier side of the population, and the longer Sibui looked at the daunting task ahead, the more she seemed to talk herself out of it. She climbed the tree without the carcass, giving us the perfect demonstration of leopard camouflage in the thick leaves. Having soothed down her ruffled fur, common sense seemed to kick in, and she left the comfort and shade of the tree to return to a spot where she could keep an eye on her lunch. Whether it's lifting their prey up into trees or picking the prey, leopards have to sort of decide exactly what is within their weight range. So that big male warthog that was knocking about over there or an adult zebra would be, on, be beyond the reach of almost all leopards except for the really, really large males. And a really large male would not be able to take on an adult zebra. It would be, it would be so phenomenally dangerous for them. It's just that little bit too large. One that tells you also is that, oh, you see that zebra is so terrified at the prospect that he had to relieve himself. What that tells you is just how much more powerful a lioness is than even an adult male leopard, because of course a single lioness can tackle a zebra. Right, on that scary note, we're going to send you across to something even scarier with Tristan, especially if you're arachnophobic. Indeed, for those of you that do not like spiders, this will be as scary as it gets because we have a massive garden orb web. And now these guys are not very many of them left at the moment. They are slowly but surely disappearing as the summer comes to an end and winter takes hold. And this is the kind of last one that I've actually seen. I haven't seen many of them at all. And just to give you, a, I'm trying to work out if I can get my hand fairly close to give you an idea of size in comparison to how big I am, how big the spider is. She's a beautiful big female and she's sitting right in the middle of her web. Now Steve has been discussing camouflage at sort of length and talking about all the different types of camouflage and why camouflage is important but sometimes out here in the wilderness we don't always have species that do camouflage something like this garden orb web spider you can see is really brightly colored and is sitting right out in the open so some insects in particular will have vivid colors and those colors are all there to warn other predators that could potentially eat them so something let's say like a lilac breasted roller or a mongoose or something like that that they have a coloration like this which is banded legs yellows and blacks to indicate that they are venomous and are not something that should be eaten and that's why this spider can sit right out in the open in a world that is full 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 of predators and not have to worry too much it's sending a very clear message which is in complete sort of opposite frame or way of surviving than what you would see from a camouflaged insect. You can also see that not only is her body color very, very kind of bright and clear, but if you look on her web area, you can see um, that she has a very thickened area of white silk, so her stipulamentum is also very exposed to try and deter many animals from actually destroying her web. Now, when we think of cam camouflage and where we kind of got to go with camouflage, there are actually little spiders on here that have a very unique type of camouflage. When spider webs are built and there's sun and it hits this, you often get, little, especially in the mornings, you get little dew drops that form. Now, dew drops will just appear as a little shiny ball on a spider's web and will not be easily noticed. But sometimes what you'll get on spider webs is a dew drop spider and they actually mimic that look. So this is quite a large one that you've got over here and it's got a silvery kind of mercury little um, abdomen and that's to try and make it look just like a little dewdrop. So it camouflages using that rather than what you see from the garden orb which is so big that uses aposomatic coloration in order to try and deter predation. So two very different contrasting techniques but both of them work really well. Now the dewdrop spider even though it's on this web and very close to this female doesn't actually have to worry too much. They don't get eaten by these guys and they are able to move around this web and steal food from the garden orb rather than the garden orb um, 
feeding off them. So Ian, you're asking why the zigzag section of this web is thicker than the rest of the web? Well, it's called a stabilimentum. Now, stabilimentum is essentially what happens is if I'm a big animal, so let's say I'm something like an elephant or something like that and I'm walking along, I can see that big white object very, very clearly. Immediately I can see that there is something there and so it's going to deter animals and they're going to go around it rather than straight through it and breaking this web. So it's there to try and kind of make a show that there is a web here please don't kind of come through it and almost as if it's like a big signboard saying kind of private property do not trespass is essentially why they've built that so it's a very very clever system that spiders use in order to be able to try and kind of establish that their web is around and for large animals like buffalo and elephants and various antelopes to not walk through here and disturb it too much fascinating though isn't it it's an absolutely beautiful spider they're one of my favorites and so i'm super excited that we managed to see one last one for the winter months. Very, very creepy, as fate says. So I know a lot of you wouldn't be too happy about it. But essentially what we're doing is we're in this area now and we're looking for Hosanna. Hosanna was seen last night. and the, the, Some of the crew did a bit of a night bumble just to see what was out there. And they found Hosanna just to the south of Treehouse Dam. And um, from there, he could have gone one of two ways. He can either go south towards Little Gauri or into Hoffman's, or he could have turned and come back north. Now, we're in a drainage line that runs on the northern side of Treehouse Dam, and it's always a good place to check. I've had Hosanna on two different kills in here, and so we're thinking maybe he might have a food source somewhere around here that he's maybe feeding on, which would be really excellent news. Now, what was... Probably the best news of the week was the fact that our little chief returned, and he returned in some fine style. The crown prince has finally returned after a four-month hiatus from Juma. He has since filled out a little more, but where's the evidence of a scrape or two around his nose? The little chief forged his way deep into Juma with purpose walking familiar routes with his usual relaxed swagger. That was until he ran into his father. Tingana did not immediately recognize that this young male was his son and sent him packing into the thicket with a low growl. But after getting a good sniff of his son's scent, he realized that the young leopard meant him no harm. Osana ran off, but not too far. He created the distance between himself and his father and finally settled in for the evening. Well, Hosanna, like I say, arrived back with a bang. Not only did he come back to the joy of all of us, but it seemed like his entire family was out that afternoon in the form of Tingana and Tlalamba and um, even Tandi was seen that afternoon, not with them, but it was an amazing thing to witness. And the interaction between Tingana and Hosanna was quite an interesting one. A lot of people sort of saw it as Tingana being very aggressive to Hosanna, but actually wasn't really the case. Um, Tingana was initially quite growly and sort of posturing, but as soon as he sniffed where Hosanna had been, immediately his demeanor relaxed. And since Hosanna has come back, we have not seen Tingana around. We haven't heard him vocalizing. And in no way has he been trying to chase Hosanna out. If he was concerned about Hosanna, we would have seen that male leopard um, behavior where there would be a lot more scent marking, vocalizing, and he he would have been on a tail of Hosanna trying to push him out of his territory, which we're not seeing from Tingana. So essentially, Tingana kind of saw him, recognized, okay, this is one of my offspring, and sort of calmed right down and left Hosanna to do his own thing, which was really good to see because otherwise, you know, Hosanna could have moved on quite quickly. But basically what we were looking at here is it seems as though something has dug out what we think is either Franklin or guinea fowl eggs. It's very old because the eggs have kind of been bleached heavily by the sun, but something has dragged it and fed off it, and we're not 100% sure what. Herbie and I were just discussing it, and we were thinking maybe uh, mongoose or something like that. So something had a meal here, and we're hoping that maybe we're going to find Hosanna on a meal. But while we go searching and figuring out what this is, let's send you across to Pat and see how he's getting on on the southern boundary. Okay, so right ahead of me, it looks like we have caught up with Tlalamba, so she did cross back over right now, and we have managed to find her. So perfect timing to come across to me, because we have literally just got here. So I'm also hearing that Hosanna is around too, so both 
well, two leopards at least on the property. We did see Tandy was at least around somewhere this morning. But she seems to be staring quite intently at something right now. I can't see what it is. She's definitely staring though. Tail, I can't see from here, seems to be quite relaxed. But very cool to have caught up with the little princess. Last time I saw her was actually down this area. And last night I did see who I thought were tracks, well, what I thought were tracks of hers. So she must be hanging down this way for quite a little bit. And of course, the last time we saw her was that epic return of Hosanna, where Hosanna almost seemed to be coming to her. She's growing up, the little princess, about 18 months now. Michelle, I also wonder what she's looking at. I can't seem to see or hear anything in the thickets to my left. Um, I can't hear anything either. She doesn't seem as interested now, but she definitely was staring. going back to having a good old groom. Looks like last time you see that sort of pink notch patch on her nose there. It's definitely not as distinct as Sana's. But I actually do think that the two look a little bit alike. So I'm being told right now that this is actually Hosanna. Well, then I have been, oh, okay. I see what I've done here. Okay, so we are with Hosanna. I was talking about that pink nose there and well, how embarrassing is that? But yes, so we are here with Hosanna, not Tlalamba. I am kind of a little bit back, but um, so that means that he also has been hanging out down around the southern area. And, well, we're about oh, a couple of kilometres, perhaps, maybe not that, maybe a little bit under from the pan where he usually does hang around. Hoping that he does get himself a meal. It's hard to see right now how hungry he is looking. So Tlalamba is somewhere close. I, I do I think I have come into a different siding to what I thought I was going to come into. So it, would be interesting to see if the two do come across one another's paths again. Still looking. Still looking out in that direction. I'm glad everyone's excited to be catching it back up with Hosanna. He did make his appearance last night for TV, although we didn't have the show. And so it's good to have him here on the Monday night as well. And he is sitting very nicely camouflaged in there. And while we sit with him, let's go to the man who's talking all about camouflage and blending in, Steve Bobo in the tent. on the screen and I said that's Osana for sure 
we couldn't really see his genitals though and that's one of the things that it's always a telltale sign isn't it but he's just a little bit more bulky but camouflaged indeed nonetheless but before we move off from our insects i've just got to show you one more photo on my screen here of a lunar moth and now lunar moths are quite commonly seen out in the savannah and in the right environment if we have a look at the screen here in the right environment very very camouflaged you can see it's sitting here against a white backdrop which makes it stand out very very well um, but imagine that on one of the branches or plants there by Hosanna you would not see this individual at all it'd be completely melted away in the background okay so well talking about cats talking about Hosanna anyway we have a little clip here we're going to start off with some cats we're going to move into a little bit of how cats camouflage themselves and um, especially starting with leopards moving through to the biggest of them all the lions so let's start this up right now and then the little chief is going to do a cameo moving in from the right hand side and the spot patterns and the colors of these animals the disruptive camouflage enables them to blend in to their habitats which are quite wide and quite ranging around but the ability as well to walk quietly to step on their feet you see how that little let me just pause it there did you see that young uh, I think it was a steambook or a daker I'm not 100% sure just moved across the screen in front of him so being a cat like this with all the camouflage in the world and all the stealth ability in the world they still need patience and they develop the search image by looking at one of those smaller antelope species Going to rewind it slightly so you can see just at the moment he's definitely stalking in this clip you can definitely see him moving through and suddenly in front of him this antelope spots him because he's not being patient enough and it moves off and so that is exactly what happens is in the right habitat the right type of camouflage certain animals are just invisible but if you move that camouflage loses its efficiency uh, but here we've got more of the clip continued with Osana at his favorite pan and you'll see him here he's just about to sort of sort of slink around there he's slinking around the pan uh, also being able to keep very very low as well and you'll see him now just melt away into the smallest patch of grass and as he goes into that small patch of grass we'll push pause there and show how while he's out in the open he's quite visible but by using his body and his ability to go very low to the ground he should he changes that shape that body posture that outline that the animals the prey animals are also using to detect a predator uh, when we see Hosanna or Tingana go up a term up mine they always come up the other side with their ears flat to change that shape uh, that they give off and the predators see it and they go the prey animals see it and they go crazy and it's that ability both predators and prey to develop a search image that not only provides them food but also keeps them safe and we keep playing this clip and you'll see how the impala are there uh, they want to come down and drink uh, but he's invisible in that long grass completely invisible okay and now we're moving forward and who could not talk about camouflage without talking about a cheetah and here we have a cheetah moving through the long grass almost invisible and once again the habitat for cheetah is what open grassland and I'm just going to pause it there for a second while we discuss it he's invisible in that long grass I can't tell if it's a male or female but just moving through beautifully covered by the grass the spots and camouflage allow the cheetah to get as close as possibly can with those pads as well if they want to stalk they could get a little bit closer but the cheetah being the fastest land mammal that we know of still needs to get as close as it possibly can to save itself some energy and even though they do still get close sometimes animals still have the ability to spot them because of that search image and you see the cheetahs when they get closer they get lower and they go flat go flat those musketeers when they were stalking wildebeest a while ago they were flat 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 until the wildebeest saw them and then they took off and took them down so we're going to keep moving through here and uh, before I start on the serval CNAC wants to know which predators got the most effective camouflage now CNAC is very hard to say I would probably go about and say at the end of the show we're going to introduce you to chameleons and chameleons have probably got the most effective camouflage out of everything because they're able to actually physically change the entire structure of their body in a way their colors to suit them um, all the cats are very good predators uh, many of the insects are good predators um, 
and owls. Think about owls as a predatory camouflage bird and night jars. They do very, very well. But there's so many to really get into. There's so many examples out here. But let's keep moving on uh, with these cats. And here we've got the serval moving through the long grass, very similar to that of the cheetah. Nice open long grass habitat. Uh, enormous ears for sensing and detecting prey that might be moving underground. And the spots probably to keep them concealed for pre uh, hunting, but also to keep them away from being caught uh, by larger predators. The amount of times I drove right past a serval, and if it wasn't for the spotlight, I wouldn't have seen it, because just stand still, don't move, and the animal is invisible. Um, with their long legs as well, they're able to clear the grass when they're moving, and those enormous ears hear the slightest of sound underground before jumping down and catching whatever rodent there might be. But to the last predator that we have, of course, um, going up to the Maasai Mara for this clip, we've got a pride of lions that are not only stalking wildebeest, but they are charging at them through the long grass. And obviously, we're just going to pause it right there, Lions are also quite a wide range of habitats. From here down in South Africa, we've got the dense thickets, open grass and areas up to the Mara where it's very, very grassy. And up in the Mara, they use the cover of the grass almost exclusively. There's no trees to cover them. And so the prey animals up there have got very different strategies as well. And with the wildebeest, large herds keeping together, they drop all their youngsters at the same time to try and avoid predation. Uh, any youngster that's younger than another one generally gets picked off and taken by lions but lions again can stalk as close as possible they're very quick over a short distance as we'll see as we continue on this clip we're going to let it play out as this lion has picked out the easiest of the individuals in the herd a young wildebeest and it's covering enormous distance with those long strides and uh, then with the powerful body stroke it pulls it to the ground so I find that so incredible when we look at all these different sort of cat-like predators out here. Um, they use most of their camouflage for stealth and hunting but then of course we also know that a lot of the camouflage goes into avoiding being seen especially for their youngsters. Uh, serval kittens get hidden away with spots, lion uh, cubs hidden away with their spots, little clalumba with their spots hidden away and um, that's how they do it. Cheetahs as well, I'll talk, that, talk about that a bit later, got a little bit of a mimicry to try and avoid other predators from getting them. So fantastic that it's all the action is happening this afternoon and I'm so happy that Patrick has found Hosanna and um, Jamie with her zebras. We were going to talk about zebras but seeing as Hosanna popped in we thought we'd just quickly do a little bit of a cat talk but it seems like Jamie's moved on from her striped pajamas and she's gone down and checking some watering holes. I have been thinking about how for the larger animals camouflage isn't really an option although having said that I have seen many an elephant disappear into a bush a couple of meters in front of me and been completely unable to see it but for scuba Steve and for snorkel Sarah that is simply not an option for them shame the two of them have been really truly forced up right up close to each other getting into each other's personal space a little bit. Sarah's been doing some rolling over to try and moisten her or his back. We have yet to actually fully confirm whether or not this this hippo with scuba Steve is in fact a female. But for now we're going to work on the assumption that she is and we have to tell you that scuba Steve and snorkel Sarah are closer than they've ever been. As the water levels continue to drop at Bufelsuk Dam, Steve and Sarah are forced into tighter quarters and ever-increasing intimacy. This is a recipe for tension, restlessness and awkward moments. If he could have, I imagine Steve would have displayed a mixture of confusion and shock as Sarah believed herself on his back. But her contrition was swift and as quickly as the restlessness had begun, it ended, and the lovebirds settled into their cosy, somewhat cramped quarters. Oh, 
A most unfortunate circumstance for Scuba Steve and an even more unfortunate circumstance for that poor frog at the summer corpture state with the true timing of a bird familiar with our safari live process. It spent the duration of that clip trying to kill the frog and then promptly, you know, swallowed it as we tried to show you that. But anyway, that's just how things go. You know, we're making light a little bit of the Scuba Steve and Snorkel Sarah situation, but it is actually quite sad, which of course is the question that, that Tracy is asking. What will happen to these guys when there's no water? They'll move, is the honest answer. They'll probably, you'll probably find that at least one of them sticks around here right up until this mud has dried out completely. During the drought of 2016, we had a hippo living in Buffles Hook Dam when there was no water, there was only mud, and the poor thing just kept trying to coat its back in whatever mud it could find and roll around in. So there's a chance one could stay here right up until the end. If sna Snera... If Sarah is a female, then she has better chances of making her way towards Chitwa, which is one of the last remaining large water sources that is large enough to support hippos. Um, Steve might have a more difficult time of things. He's a big dominant bull, which means that he would have to find himself fighting for his right to move into Chitwa. And as times get tougher, hippos become more and more aggressive. We're going to see more cases of infanticide and we're going to see a lot of injured hippos and very thin hippos wandering around because of course they've also got to find nutrients for themselves which becomes more and more difficult as the grass disappears and dries out. So it really is a tough time for them. It's a very sad thing but it is part of the reality of life out here and it's, ha it's happened to many a hippo many a year but they will have to move. Just by the way, that dung flinging example or that Sarah gave us in that clip is not a clear indication that we're dealing with a male or a female. Both males and females do that in water as she has just showed us. Although I think what she's doing there now is flicking water over her back and over her side. Davi, is Wingston behind you? Is he gone? Oh, is he a little bit too far to the side? Uh, no. All right, we'll try and show you Wingston a little bit. He doesn't want to be seen now. Wingston, for those of you that don't know, is a, is a hornbill that spends a lot of time around Buffles Hook Dam. And we call him Wingston Churchbill. Uh, I don't know who came up with that. I can only imagine it was Kirsten or James. Hello. Yes, we're talking about you. Come on. I want to tell a story about you, but I can't do that. And... Oh, cook, 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 cook. He's talking to me. Cook, 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 cook. Cook, cook, cook having a oh i'm sorry it was taylor it was taylor who came up with that my apologies taylor i didn't realize oh cool. whoa, whoa, whoa. okay all right he's cross now Darby. he's furious with us we had a proper meeting of minds there <laughs> he's highly entertaining okay all right, you can't you can't hear my story about Winston Churchbull just yet because uh, Tristan is out on. F I'm scared he's going to attack me. Tristan is out on foot, and he would love to update you as to what he's up to. <laughs> Indeed, we are out on foot, Jamie, and we've made it towards Treehouse Dam. We were obviously hoping that we were going to try and find some sort of sign of Hosanna, but Pat beat us to the punch and found Hosanna actually quite far from where we are now, which is not really surprising given how young male leopards are. They often can move around quite a bit, but any of these kind of waterhole areas at this time of the year are really great places to always come and check for any sign animals, whether that be predators like um, lions or leopards or any of the antelope species and if you actually scan along the sort of edge of the water point here you can see that there are just sort of tracks of animals going up and down all over the place so this is an area that is utilized heavily by all the various animals that are out here and at this time of the day late afternoon is a very kind of good place to come and check for various things particularly the cats, though, the cats like to drink at this time of the day. As that sun is setting, it's a cool winter's afternoon, and so they'll come and they'll have a bit of a drink before they start to go off and either go territorial marking or they'll then go and start hunting. Now, 
this particular dam at the moment is probably given of our bigger dams, if you want to call it, so Twin Dams, Buffalzook and, and Treehouse, is probably the healthiest in terms of its size. It's still got quite a lot of water. Um, it's actually quite a deep dam, and so there's still a fair amount that's in here, and it probably will last the longest this year. Last year it was Buffalzook Dam that lasted the longest, but I think this dam will last fairly long, and it's going to be interesting to see whether or not this dam then becomes a much more focal point, because during the summer months, it really kind of lost its sort of, I wouldn't say its charm, but it lost its kind of activity around it. Um, last year and the year before, this was a very busy point for us and we had a lot of sightings around this kind of area. But since Shadow's disappearance, Hukumuri's arrival, Shadulu having her cubs and kind of Hosanna leaving, this area became almost devoid of, of sort of leopards. We've seen very few leopards at Triars Dam over the course of the last few months. And now that it's getting dry and if Buffalo dries up and Twin Dams dries up, I would imagine this will once again become a fairly sort of hot spot for our spotty cats. Well, that's my opinion anyway. Maybe not. It might not happen that way, but I think that it has to. In other words, there's not enough water anywhere else. So uh, you would think um, they would come into this area. Now, Nancy, you say standing this close to water makes you nervous. Um, well, it's, yes, I suppose so. But there's no crocs that we've seen tracks for coming in this area. It's not to say that there isn't crocodiles in here. That's the thing that if you ever come out to Africa, do not trust any water that is still standing in a wilderness area. And even if it's not in a wilderness area, crocodiles can be anywhere. So you must always be very, very careful and try not to go into water like this. But essentially, we've spent so much time driving around this area and this dam, we would have seen tracks or some sort of sign of a crocodile sort of bathing or, and, and trying to catch some sun rays, which we haven't. So standing here is okay. And we know there's no hippos in here too because there's no tracks of hippos anywhere around. Now, unfortunately, our sort of treehouse dam mission has been a bit of a failure this afternoon, but Hosanna's return could not have been any more successful than if he had made an appearance at the local watering hole in front of camp. The day breaks in Juma, and it is not a dream. The Crown Prince has indeed returned after four months away. Masana returned to what is without doubt one of his favorite haunts on Juma. The Gauri Dam is the perfect resting spot for our little chief, with easy access to food, water, and lots of camouflage. As the sun rose higher, the little chief retreated to a nearby thicket to rest much to the joy of us all. Well, we are still here with Hosanna, and he is, well, moving very, very quickly at the moment. We almost lost him for a second there. He did what he has been doing quite a lot lately and draw, crossing drainages in kind of thicker terrain, making it difficult. So I'm just going to move up so we can get closer to him now. But he was very mobile just before. It almost seemed like he was kind of stalking and chasing something in the drainage line, but whatever it may be, he is definitely active at the moment. And well, we, as we have all watched him over the last week or so, we have definitely seen that he hasn't really gotten himself a whole great deal to eat. And well, we're hoping that we can be there the moment he does get a kill that he can actually keep for himself as he will probably come up at this oh no I'm just going to get on the other side of this termite mound here he may come up it still it doesn't look like it um, let me go through here SA Safari Sun wants to know, oops, sorry, this is just a real tricky spot, wants to know what are the black spots under a leopard's eyes for? Well, if you've ever seen anyone play baseball, you may notice that they also do this, that they have black marks under their eyes. And that is because the sun reflects less off black. And well, when you're trying to look at something, obviously a reduction in glare helps your vision. And so we see those black dots under the eyes. We also see it in cheetahs as well. And as I said, just reduces glare and allows them to see it better. And well, who knows what he's seeing right now. There's been quite a few times. Now, sorry, I'm just trying to help some other vehicles into this siding. 
Um, I came in off Weaver's Nest. If you go up, you'll see my two track come off uh, to the west there, just a little bit, maybe three, four hundred metres up from the cut line. And he's still mobile west. So our boy marching on in this golden, golden sunlight. It's a beautiful time to be with him. And well, it's a really good demonstration at the use of the colors of leopards to kind of blend in and match their environment. Obviously they sit in thickets and dense vegetation. And when the light comes through, it's going to make a lot of kind of shadows and spots, which is reflected in the coat of a leopard. Well, not it's reflected literally, but that's what it matches. And so it helps to camouflage when they are in this kind of semi-thick habitat with a little bit of sunlight coming through. I'm just gonna move up again. Oh, what's that? Oh, Stanbock. There's a Stanbock coming through there, but Hasana didn't seem to notice it. And whilst I keep up with the little chief, let's go back to Steve in the tent to tell you more about his interesting topic. Thanks, Pat. It is indeed a beautiful afternoon in the light. The colours are changing. I can finally see properly without it getting in my eye and making me squint. But we were talking about camouflage and you saw Jamie with her frog getting caught. And well, on the screen, I've just got a picture of a couple of frogs. There are many, many frogs around there and some of them are extremely camouflaged. And if we have a little look over here, we've got a guttural toad, uh, which the color camouflage on the body makes him obviously very, very sort of well blending in to the environment. And then on the right hand side, you can see on the top right is the southern foam nest frog. At night time, generally they're this color. And then in the daytime, when it is very hot, they go white like that in the bottom picture to maybe blend in, but also to uh, sort of reflect a lot of the sun's rays so that they don't get that hot. So it's kind of a way of sort of avoiding overheating. And you find foam necks frogs around the country, around the park anyway, throughout the year. But the camouflage didn't work very well for that frog with the hummercorp. Okay, so I'm going to show you a quick little uh, clip about zebra and we were talking about all different types of disruptive camouflage and with the zebra, I'm going to push play on this clip here and this is clearly a clip from the Maasai Mara and once again the habitat of the zebra is in the open so they don't really have the ability to go and hide in the thickets uh, like kudu or leopard would and by moving through there with their black and white stripes almost forms an optical illusion as it's very difficult for the predator to pick out an individual. It's difficult for them to pick out that search image and uh, the youngsters blend in as the herd moves as one. That optical illusion sort of forms there and they almost look like one solid mass of animal. Now looking in the middle of the shot now, try and see if you can see that youngster that's coming from the back there with mum. You can't really um, because it, the legs are the same height, the body is the same sort of size, it's a little bit lower than mum, but the stripes make it blend in with the background. I'm going to pause it there. You'll see a couple of the youngsters now in the front of shot. Um, their legs are the same height as mum, um, but the body is a little bit lower. But the blending in of those stripes is how the zebras avoid predation because lions will charge into the herd and they'll try and separate them like they did that wildebeest but they need to be able to pick out the individual the easiest target lions always go for the easiest target all predators do and zebras avoid a lot of predation by being able to melt that youngster into the herd and be protective so just let the clip play out till the end marvelous scenes of zebras up in the mara and this is something i've never seen before zebras having a swim without needing to cross a river a crocodile-free pan. 
very very cool so also the the mane of hair that you find on animals that sort of not just the coloration but also the mane we're going to talk about kudu and the like just now how it helps them to break out that outline and uh, we spoke about how tingana and hosana and they like to come up a term amount of flatten the ears it loses that shape uh, it's why in game viewers we talk about people not standing up because an animal suddenly sees a human's body form and they freak out but in the box we all kind of camouflage in to the box because the animals with their black and white vision don't have that depth perception that we have so for them it's all about an outline and if the outline is not there and not able to see it for, just can't hunt uh, so many times you'll see uh, especially down here in juma uh, leopards and lions walk straight past stenbok daker who just sort of stand there and without the flicking of the ears or the moving they're completely invisible and that is how the camouflage and those disruptive sort of markings help them to really blend in nicely with the background but um, Jamie was talking about the frogs there was the frogs um, but here is a beautiful shot if we go back to the slideshow and I just how's that for a beautiful image of zebras and you can see how well they sort of melt into each other there um, us with the black and white or the ability to see color we're able to see depth so we can actually see through that herd but as a lion or a leopard for example they would just see a wall of movement an optical illusion it would make it very difficult to pick out the very individual that you wanted to hunt and that is how the strategy of the zebras worked in the open plain system they are not a seasonal breeder they breed whenever they want to uh, wildebeest on the other hand are black and they stand out in the in the environment and they have to drop all their babies at the same time and their survival strategy is many many youngsters at the same time and if any of them are a little bit younger than the others very very easily are they picked off by lions and we've got some noises going on or oh, there's some impala shouting Hello, Sam, you, age 12. Well, you want to know how many zebra species there are? Down in South Africa, we've got the Plains Zebra, which used to be known as the Birchall Zebra. We also get the Hartman's Mountain Zebra. And um, hmm, we get the Grevy Zebra up in, in Kenya. The Plains Zebra up there is actually the same species, although they look slightly different. And I'm forgetting one. I've got Grant in the house with me, so Grant's going to tell me what the other species is. Grant, Cape Mountain Zebra, Cape Mountain Zebra. Hartman zebra, plain zebra, which is the Birchels, and the Grevy zebra, and there might be another one that I've never seen before. Those are the other ones I know of. I think that's it. Grant's giving me the thumb up. Thanks, Grant. So I hope that answers your question, Samu. And they've evolved like that because of the open system, and that is how the evolution has happened. Not all animals can evolve camouflage. Some of them use hollows. Some of them use the bushes for cover. But if you're in the open system, you've evolved over many, many, many years. And if you're successful, then that genetic trait that is with you gets passed along, and it just gets more and more and more elaborate. Okay, well, we're going to continue on trying to find you some wonderful information. In the meantime, let's go back on to Jamie, who I think has moved off from Scuba and Snorkel Sarah. Wow, what a beautiful, beautiful scene we have here. Hosanna has halted his walk and is now sitting atop a termite mound with a very very nice view ahead of him. It almost seems as if he is watching the sunset himself. And I wonder, I quite often wonder whether animals get enjoyment out of seeing things, seeing aesthetic things, or inspiring things, such as a sunrise or a sunset. I know it would definitely signify things for them, perhaps as, well, maybe it's time to go out and hunt, or for other creatures, maybe it's time to start winding down and find a nice place to hide for the night. But for this cat, hopefully it does mean, well, a bit of a feed, a bit of a hunt, hopefully for us. But he has been back on the property for quite a while now, over a week, and geez, that has gone quick. And whilst this cat moves on, there is not just cats that we have this week. We also had some wild dogs. Let's have a look at one of the couple of encounters we had with them. The dawn chorus had not even begun, and the wild dogs were already up and alert. 
pointing their ears forward, they listened keenly to the sounds of lions calling in the distance. Their strength as a pack lies in their ability to hear predators approaching. After determining that they were in no danger, the pack stretched their limbs and warmed their muscles with a little play. A hyena watched the pack from a distance, lurking to scavenge on any spoils that the pack might bring down. The play increased in vigour as the dogs became fully warmed up, after which they trotted down the road in search of breakfast. Okay, so he has just moved down from this termite mound and he's making his way again. He, again, got up quite quickly and moved very quickly and then settled straight back down. So he's been very sporadic in his movements this afternoon, kind of one minute he'll be jogging, the next minute he'll be doing a nice casual pace and then the next second he'll stop. So seeming a bit indecisive this afternoon, young Hosanna. Looks like he is going north at the moment. I wonder if he's going to follow the road or cross again. He's going to cross again. So I'm going to try and get the one up on him right here right now and try and get a little bit ahead so we can actually stop and have a proper look at our favourite cat because he's been doing this a lot to me lately where I'm just kind of trailing, trailing, trailing. So if I try and get around... Okay, well, here we are sitting very nicely with him now. He should walk past us any second. So, well, we saw those wild dogs kind of relaxed and at play and doing what wild dogs do best, but something else they do very well is hunt, and we were also very lucky to catch up with that as well. Wild dogs are often on the move, but on this morning, the Sands Pack was hungry and on the prowl. A water buck and her youngster stumbled on the pack. It was immediately clear that they were in grave danger. The wild dogs moved in, but the water buck was quickly off her mark and creating distance. Her prancing youngster in tow. At first, it seemed that the pack had lost interest as they wandered off, a tactic meant to lull the water buck into a false sense of security. It worked. The wild dogs are notorious for their hunting prowess and their strike was quick and sudden. The helpless mother could only run away as the pack did what they do best. The sounds of the hunt inevitably drew in a hyena who first sat watching before attempting to scavenge a morsel. The hyena's vocalisation drew in other hyenas but the pack remained a strong, formidable force. They made one last attempt before the pack mobilised and chased them away successfully. The dogs quenched their thirst as they reflected on their successful morning. What an epic sighting that was for Steve to have pretty much coming back to straight after his leave. And well, hopefully we can get another sighting like that this afternoon, except instead of a pack of wild dogs, one single leopard. So Asana is still sitting here, 
Kind of moving from term out. Looks like he might have seen something here. is something we commonly see, not just leopards do, but many other animals using the top of a termite mound to look out. You obviously get a better view. And hopefully you can spot himself some prey. Now, I wonder if Hosanna did any mating while he was away. I don't think he would be quite ready yet. We haven't seen him, or at least I have never seen him scent marking or doing anything really overly territorial at all, to be honest. So that makes me think that perhaps he hasn't just yet. Kat wants to know how many days a leopard can go without eating. Well, that is really quite variable. It could... I mean, it, it starts to hit a point where even though they may be still alive, their body may still be functioning, there's kind of a point of no return that they will hit where the amount of energy it costs to do just anything really will start to outweigh what their body can expend. And so even the cost of digesting in terms of energy can start to become difficult. And after that time, well, that's when they kind of start to come back. But, I mean, well, go to a point where they can't come back from. But you will see maybe every... I mean, as long as they're eating once a week, but uh, about one to two weeks is when they'll start hitting this point. And then anything beyond that, it just starts to get more and more difficult. Okay, well, Asana is sitting nice and high up off the ground at the moment, but Tristan is currently looking at something on the ground. Well, as Asana stares off into the distance, we sit here analysing his little footprints that he left behind over the course of the last 24 hours. And it's interesting to kind of look at these tracks. If you look at them, we've got these here and they kind of go up the road and then cut off. Now these tracks, if you had to see them, most people would say, well, these are very fresh tracks and this leopard would be not too far away. But actually these tracks were from last night already. So they've already kind of a full day has almost gone past. Um, and it shows you why in winter, as much as it's easier to track because tracks like this are, are easy to spot in the soft substrate the roads are not hard from the rain it has its own challenges when you kind of track in winter time um, tracks stay fresher for much longer periods particularly if you get really nice weather like we've been having and we haven't had too much in the way of um, wind you won't get too much disturbance on the track itself you can see there's still a little bit of a kind of shine towards the back end there's not too much debris that's actually in this track at all and so most people would think well a very very fresh track something that you can follow but if you just kind of start looking a little bit closer you start to notice that there's slight issues so if you have a look on the toe area you can see the front edges of the toes have been blown away. So there's kind of rocks that have, or little stones that have moved over the top of the track. So that's already starts to indicate that it's taken some weathering. The actual crispness of the edges of the track has also changed a little bit. And if you look at the back pad area, you can see there's almost a dust layer that's over the top. It no longer has that shine that you see. Now, the reason why these tracks would be quite difficult is if we follow them kind of up the road, is that there's nothing that's actually walked on top. So here is where a Franklin was walking and the Franklin has missed the track but normally that's what you look for when you're looking at tracks and you're trying to work out freshness is you try to find some sort of diurnal bird like this that maybe has walked over the top and you can see in this case it's missed it and the track doesn't seem like it's intersected but if I show you the crispness and it, here's probably a really good example of this track here look at how defined those edges are they are perfect 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 edges over there with the little claws that you can see whereas if you look at Hosanna's track you see how the edges just seem soft don't they it's almost like someone has put a little bit of misting over the top of it and so that's how you can tell the difference between these sort of tracks and whether or not they're fresh so even though they look pretty good these are in fact actually from last night and would be not worth following because Hosanna's done a lot of movement since then now because these are not very good tracks and because we've seen them what we do 
do, and at this time of the year what is very, very good to do, is as you walk, is just to stand on them. And you might ask why you would stand on them. The reason you stand on them like that is so that the next guy that drives past you doesn't think that these tracks are fresh and they then get followed. So it's always a good thing to do in the winter months is just stand on a couple of the tracks and the guys know. Sarah, the difference between leopard and, and lion tracks, um, sorry, excuse me, is that essentially size is, is probably the biggest thing. Um, a lion of this size, <coughs> excuse me, <coughs> would be accompanied by a adult female um, so we'd see a much bigger track accompanying this this would be a little young lion that would be walking around um, so that's the one thing is size the second thing is that i find is that leopards in terms of their sort of track is a lot more compacted so the the back pad area that you have here is sits very close with the toes so you see the toes are quite close together um, and, and very close to the back pad, whereas with lions I find that the toes sit a little bit further away. It's probably just because of the scale of the actual track itself is bigger on a lion, um, and the toes themselves are much larger on a lion than what you see here. The only other thing that you could potentially confuse if you've got a really big leopard and a female lion would be that there's a few diagnostic kind of features between those two tracks. So even let's say that we got a female or a lioness that was the same size as this male leopard. Let's may exaggerate and say that the male leopard track is bigger. What you find with the back or the front pad, should I say, because this is the front over here and this is the back that's stepped over the top. If you look at the front pad of this male leopard, you see that it does that and then it rounds back into the track all right so we're going to have a kind of circular shape that comes back in if it was a lioness um, and her front pad her front pad i'm going to do it on the back pad here because it's easier for you to see but her front pad would have that a much more angular sort of v-shape to it all right so the male leopard or even male lions they also have this they have this rounded kind of shape so if you follow the edge of the track it pulls you back in whereas a lioness if you follow the edge of the track it actually takes you away so if you had to draw a line following you end up going that way whereas a leopard you end up forming a, a nine or a six depending on which way you're looking at it so that's a way that you can tell the difference between a female lion and a male leopard if their tracks were close in size but really the size is kind of what you're looking for more than anything else um, in my experience anyway <laughs> it's the easiest way to tell the difference between the two right now that's a male leopard track we've been talking about lionesses and we've been kind of meandering about trying to find hosanna as well as any sort of sign of tundi and luckily earlier in the week we caught up with tundi as she snacked on well a bony impala head there has been much speculation that the queen is either about to be or already is a mother of a new set of cubs However, seeing her moving about with no suckle marks and no evidence of a pregnant belly has led us to conclude that her youngest cub is still Tlalamba. On this morning, the queen was out on the hunt for breakfast, but after staring keenly into a thicket and a little stalking, she decided to give up. However, a few days later we came across Tundi feasting on the remains of a male impala. It was unclear whether this was from her own hunting efforts or was a prize from her scavenging prowess. Made no difference to Tundi though, as she dug in and enjoyed her meal, gnawing on the bones and marrow, showing off her canines, which show the signs of a hard life out in the wild. Satisfied and content, the queen then attended to her appearance. Well, and like I say, it was a bit of a bittersweet sighting. One, because it was nice to see Tundi, but two, because unfortunately it did show that she didn't have suckle marks and so if she did have cubs she's either lost them or she just never had them to start with it was it's difficult to tell i mean if they were given she'd given birth and, and had them and they died very quickly then it's very possible that she kind of lost them early on but what i wanted to show you is here you've got um hosana's track and we often talk about how difficult it is for our leopards out here and on the dam cam we've seen it many times as a leopard walks they get followed by hyenas so you can see here 
This is a hyena that is following Hosanna, and it's often why when leopards make a kill, they immediately lose their kill because um, hyenas are on their trail. So when they walk on roads like this, hyenas will actually track them down the roads and try and follow them as much as possible so that they can thieve from them during the night. And you'll find with very clever females when they have cubs, and Tandi is one of them, is that she doesn't walk like this on a road. She'll actually just cross the road straight over, and so it's much harder for the hyenas to follow her trail and be able to keep up with her and, and, and follow her back to the den site or potentially to a meal that she's got. So some of them will employ different tactics. Hosanna hasn't learned that yet. He just walks straight down roads and the hyenas follow him. Good. We're going to start moving fairly swiftly back towards camp. It's starting to get quite dark now out on walk. And so while we do that, let's send you back across to Jamie. Alrighty. Well, speaking of hyenas, I was just attempting to follow June through the vegetation to try to figure out where she's been hiding her little bundles of joy. Now, for those of you that don't know, June is one of the female hyenas in the Juma clan and she's one of the mothers at the moment. She's got two little bundles of joy that I haven't seen in a while. So I thought I'd try and follow her through here, but she gave me the slip so quickly it was quite obvious that was not going to pan out the way I wanted it to. So we've obviously arrived in the area where the Juma clan has their den, or dens, plural. At the moment, there's two cubs, two sets of cubs at the, of denning age, and they seem to have split up a little bit. And I just want to have a quick check around a den we've been nicknaming Jerry's Den. She's the one who found it. And maybe we'll get lucky. Maybe they're hiding in there. Now, I just have to remember how to get there. The last den that was active is over there. So I think I've got to go down this way. Towards that Valenites. I'll figure it out. Somewhere in here. Somewhere in here. I just want to double check that it isn't active. All right. So while I head off in the, that direction, the most important thing or weighty thing on everyone's mind is whether or not Ribbon has two cubs or one. Of all of the animals out here, hyena dynamics take the most time and patience to truly get to grips with their intricacies. They're almost impossible to follow through the vegetation, which means that their den site is central to our understanding of the clan's goings on. This, in turn, requires hours of time spent there, often simply watching the mothers catching up on their well-deserved rest. But those who have the forbearance and discipline to sit through the quieter times will find themselves richly rewarded. The complexities and dominance displays are a constant source of entertainment, but it is the cubs that steal the show time after time. Their antics, their innocence, their careless wonder at the world around them. Moments like this are precious, and we appreciate every second of them, because experience has taught us that they are often fleeting. As the wild chooses her own storylines that do not always have a happy ending. In this case, this was the last time we saw Ribbon's second cub. I'm incredibly sad about Ribbon's cub. I'm, I'm still sort of holding out a little bit of hope, but to be honest, I'm starting to feel as though it's a bit hopeless at this stage. It's been gone for so long. I'm going to go and see if I can find Ribbon. I just want to have a look at this den, because it looks as though it's been used recently. Uh, this is a den that we found only relatively recently and then they disappeared out of it. Something's been excavating there properly, but I'm not certain it's a hyena. Let's just go have a look, see if I can get a grip on the tracks there. It doesn't look like hyena tracks, it looks like warthog tracks from where I'm sitting. Mm, yeah, no, that is, this is not hyenas. Ah, uh, mind you. 
Right, we're just going to poke our noses around, not in, but around, see if we can use them to sniff out the hyenas. The smell, of course, is something that animals can't always hide. Well, indeed, Jamie, a very sad state of affairs. Where has Ruben's cub gone? Very sad. It does happen, everybody. Um, hyenas are one of those individuals that don't necessarily need the camouflage. Their cubs live underground, and uh, that's where they stay for most of the time as protection. So that evolutionary adaptation allows them for protection as well. Not needing, you've seen them when they're small, they're just little black balls get a little bit spotted as you get older but that's probably a, um, an evolutionary sort of thing that happened long time ago and they probably didn't live in holes at one stage who knows much quicker to learn how to live in a hole than to develop a whole new fur of co uh, coat of fur but um, we're going to move on to our next topic of camouflage this afternoon and that is looking at antelope and uh, on the screen on my powerpoint i've got a few pictures of antelope and of scrub hair of course and how many times have we walked past scrub hairs in the morning and they just dart out they are extremely camouflaged and what it is that they do is they stand very still so it's that freeze tactic uh, that keeps scrub hairs safe from most of the predators that would do them harm and naming them scrub hairs as well they live in little bushes and thickets of grass so they use them their camouflage the dappled light and all that sort of stuff to keep themselves safe but looking at the tragalaphus family the spiraled horn animals such as the nyala We've got a male nyala up in the left, female on the right. You can see the sort of sexual dimorphism there. Uh, but they've both got the lines on the body, and they've both got a little bit of fur on the body. And uh, same as the bushbuck and the kudu. We're going to go to a clip now. There's no bushbuck, unfortunately, in the clip. But looking at the picture of the bushbuck, you see the spots and the, the fur on the back, which basically just breaks up that outline. That would be the sort of what the leopard is looking for. They're looking for this antelope shape. But with that fur, with t um, sort of vegetation, the spots, the lines, make that animal just basically disappear, lose their three-dimensional characteristic. Okay, so I'm just going to end this and we're going to go into our antelope clip for the evening and it starts off with some kudu and now talking about kudu this a pat I'm just going to pause it there because as you pause it if you just look carefully you'll notice that they are quite invisible if you pause it uh, they're invisible but this man of course is a little bit interested in the female uh, which is a behavior that is driven by his sexual desire not his need to defend himself against predators so he's moving if there's any form of predation around any alarm call they just stand very very still so back to the clip We'll unpause it again and move forward. Uh, the kudu, obviously the habitat type for the kudu is in the thickets, the open woodland, where they use the vegetation, just like the bushbuck and the nyala, for covering themselves. And here, moving on to nyala, moving as a group as well, they walk like a leopard could walk, very quietly. I'm just going to pause it there. Very quietly, they step with their back foot where their front foot stepped. They've got very big ears. Those stripes, that disruptive coloration, the hair on the back, helps them to blend in with the thickets behind. Because once again, the habitat is sort of more closed woodlands and thickets. Bushbuck a little bit more closed even still. And the ability to just stand very, very still. Predators just walk directly past so let's just let this clip play out a little bit because we're going to get on to the third sort of type of camouflage that our antelope archer exhibit and that is the very common impala that has been shouting off in the distance and as we come into the impala clip we'll just pause it there as we get to the group of females standing in the open and impala also, um, their habitat is sort of edge specialist from woodland into open areas. And they don't have the same strategy as kudu and nyala. They don't freeze. If anything, they alarm call and they run. Uh, but they run as a group and they jump up in the air and they show all sorts of sort of acrobatics and show how fit they are. So it's a form of sort of pronking. Their mixture between thickets and open areas, sort of what springbok and gazelle would do. More of a jumping in the air, evading the predators, showing them how strong they are rather than how hiding but the impala also have the ability to hide in their numbers when you look at this photo here um, we get the white belly and then the side of the body is a little bit sort of paler and then the top of the body is much more sort of darker sort of orange and that's called counter shading and with the right light 
those impala really do blend into each other and it forms a sort of camouflage and a confusion to that which the zebra sort of display and it's very difficult once again for a lion or leopard to individually pick one of these individuals out when they're in a unit like that but as soon as they all start running and sprinting everywhere and the leopard is hopefully very flat in the grass and if the pilot come close enough they'll catch them because of their disruptive camouflage allowing the predator to come closer through the confusion but being in groups like that the defense that they have because of all their ears and all their noses very hard to catch uh, an impala unless they run towards you. Minamu, you want to know what determines a camouflage tactic and it's all got to do with habitat. What is your survival strategy? Where do you live? And animals have evolved all around the world, doesn't matter where you go to, depending on where they live. On a coral reef, on an ocean floor, on a riverbed, on a river bank, in a specific tree, on a specific flower. And that is how it's worked. Obviously, it's taken a very long time, especially for, this, for many animals to evolve that coloration, that ability to, to blend in. But those that blended in better than one, they had babies. And the one that didn't blend in, he died and had no babies. And slowly, 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 over time, uh, prey animals got more camouflaged, predators got more stealthy and more camouflaged. And it's essentially this arms race, uh, like in the World Wars, where the one country got a weapon, another country got another weapon and it just got more and more and more and more and if one eventually out competes one that species will go extinct but they're constantly battling and battling and battling well as night starts to fall camouflage definitely disappears for those of us on foot Tristan is making his way back hopefully he can still find the way Well, we are about to camouflage ourselves in darkness at this stage. We still got a bit of a way to walk, but a beautiful sunset in the distance at the moment. It's very, very pretty. Always my, one of my favorite times of the day to be out this on sunrise. Um, the bush is just such a kind of special place at these times. Not only do you get beautiful colors, but generally find there's this kind of transition of sounds. You get in the mornings, nocturnal fading into diurnal and again vice versa in the evenings and you get these moments on both sides where it just goes quiet for a few minutes it's not long but it goes completely quiet and it's just a kind of the smell of So some of you may have noticed that the camera just shook because we were walking up the road and Seb hadn't seen Herbie standing there and Herbie was standing there and Seb looked around and got the biggest fright of his life and the whole camera shook. Are you right there, Seb? Yeah, I was just like, whoa. That? <laughs> that was classic. Anyway, Herbie, everyone's fine. Herbie was just standing there. He didn't actually even jump out at you, Seb. It's just one of those moments when you see something out of the corner of your eye and you like, what is that? That was very funny, but anyway. Um, so as I was saying, you get these kind of still moments, and they, they are a time, I always think, where it's like you kind of really feel like you're immersed in the bush, and it's that stillness that is, in some way, kind of, I don't know, it's something that you always want more of, and um, I always enjoy that time, so it's always nice to be out, and even on foot is probably even better. It's been a giraffe, yeah, and it's walking around. I don't know where it's gone, but there are tracks for it going down towards the dam so it's always my favorite time of, of the day to be around and um, the problem is is that on walk it's not really ideal because your field of view becomes severely hampered um, and you can't see behind bushes I mean if Seb shows you just these bushes here to the right in front of the dam this is a kind of quarry thicket now if there's an elephant or a buffalo um, behind those things you're not going to be able to see it until you're right on top of it because of how dark the bushes and how dark they are and so it's why we try and avoid being out on foot is just because your ability to see things at distance becomes quite tricky right now as we kind of move our way very quickly towards camp there's been a character that has been doing very much the same this week and has been very busy and always kind of moving and it's the little princess and it's making her rather tough to catch up with. The young princess continues to look the picture of royalty and poise. She has kept a low profile since her uncle's return, a necessary move for a young leopardess who is no longer under her mom's immediate care. Her eyes and ears are constantly alert 
and after spending a good portion of the day resting, she stretched her muscles by slinking through the grass, her perfect camouflage on display as she moved through the winter landscape. After the brief catwalk, it was time for the princess to settle down for another rest. It's one of the prettier leopards that we've got out here, especially when she sits and she poses. She's got these beautiful eyes and face, and she's at that size now where she's still quite small, but is looking like a proper leopard. She is very pretty, and I love spending time with her. Um, it's a pity that she has been a little shy of late, and it's weird because some days she's fine. I mean, I had her the other day briefly, albeit, um, but she was fine. She didn't really do much. She just kind of walked past me, and that was the end of that. Um, and she wasn't really in any way skittish, but then sometimes I hear that she gets a little bit sh sort of shy and she darts around, and I'm pretty sure it's just a young leopard that's trying to stay safe that she behaves that way, but um, it's always so nice when you can catch up with her and she's completely relaxed on a mound or something like that. She's such a beautiful little girl, so hopefully she's going to stick around for a lot longer. Right, we're going to kind of, like I say, hastily make our way back to camp before it gets really dark. In the meantime, though, let's send you back across to Pat, who's struggling to keep up with the little chief. <laughs> I'm definitely going to watch back that moment that I just heard about with Herbie later on tonight. That sounds quite humorous. But what is not humorous at all, in fact, is that Hosanna has given us a big slip. So, what happened was Corky and one other hyena that I couldn't actually identify actually were following him for a while without us knowing and then we caught on to them and well as soon as Hosanna then caught on to them he actually tried sorry I'm just gonna make my way through here and pass this over so what he tried to do was climb a tree and get away from them and well he didn't really make, he wasn't able, oh, here's, well, speak of the devil, here's one of the hyenas right here in front of me. So that's a good sign though, because they were following Hosanna, so that means he still might be around. So I will follow this hyena. But uh, yeah, they sent him into a very fast walk and then we, we picked back up on him he looked like he was crossing the Mawadi and then he crossed back over and we managed luckily to catch back up with him again but again these hyenas are just pressing on him as we're seeing right here and kind of sending him away now they're moving back down this way we've been taken through our paces yet again today by Hosanna. Okay, well, it wasn't just leopards and wild dogs last week. We also did manage, oh, okay, I'm not gonna go back through here because there's no way I'm getting back over the other side. But uh, yes, we also had lions last week. It was good to catch up with the evokers and let's go look at that. It is hard work being a dominant male coalition. Mohawk attended to his morning toilet, ensuring that all evidence of last night's meal were cleaned away. His brother, Blondie, could not be bothered as he hit the snooze button one more time. When he finally awoke, he sat for a moment, gathering his senses and his bearings before realising that his brother had moved on. But not too far. Still limping slightly, he ambled over to his brother. Together, they continued doing the hard work that male coalitions usually do. <laughs> yes, yes, very hard work being a male lion at some times. Oh, they do seem like they have it pretty relaxed a majority of the time, our male lions that we do frequently see here on Safari Live. And while well, still just kind of searching around here for Hosanna, but uh, as I said, those hyenas just went into a spot that was a bit tricky for us to get through. 
And well, now I'm just trying to negotiate my way through here. And I'm also keeping my ear out as well because there were some birds when we were with Hosanna shouting at him. And well, that is something that not only birds, but squirrels and mongooses and various other animals will also do. So hopefully we can hear something or see something. But uh, yeah, unfortunately, just those hyenas kept pressing and pressing. Okay, so one evoker showing wasn't enough. We do have another one from last week, which was very good. Let's go take a look at that one. New day in Juma found Blondie by himself, his brother Mohawk, nowhere in sight. The brothers will usually locate each other through contact calls. But Blondie remained alone as he moved off through the thickets. Seeming to be on an important mission, he sniffed the area keenly, sometimes walking in a circle as he followed the scent. Perhaps he was tracking down a female in estrus, or simply trying to locate his brother's whereabouts. Finding no joy from the exercise, he abandoned it and spent the rest of the day contemplating his next move. Uh -huh. So, it would be great to also have seen the Incahumas, but you know, they are still dwelling kind of about north of the property at the moment, so they could come down any time soon and well it's also a bit of a mystery whether they have started denning or not and if so where the cubs are one thing we also don't know the location of is hosana but i'm just making my way back along where we lost him and using my spotlight to try and pick back up on him but the pace he was moving at i have a feeling he may have moved off quite away I'm just glad to be back on a road now. I can kind of orientate myself. And it seems like I've collected quite a bit of wood down my back after that. But uh, I'm taking it quite slowly now. Someone who is not, though, is Jamie. And she's doing a Ferrari safari. Who's this? I'm breaking a rule, actually. I don't usually Ferrari safari at night, but I just had to get us here before the end of drive. I've just chatted to one of the other guides, and in fact, I, if I'd taken a different route, I wouldn't have known this at all. But the hyenas have moved back to Shibamo Road Den. Um, so I wanted to just get us here. I was gonna say, I've been driving around, there's signs of tracks, but there's no sign of the hyenas. Anyway, apparently they're here. So I thought, well, let me just quickly zip in before the end of Safari Lives, and let's just see who we've got around. Mm, hopefully they haven't all wandered off now, but they apparently were about earlier. Well, there we go. That's a nice little surprise. At least I assume this is the den that he's talking about. I'm just gonna use a spot just to make sure I don't drive into any personal space. Oh dear, I think we're a little bit too late now on this. Let's just have a look around. No, we're not. Someone's up. But I think without an adult, unfortunately. We'll do a quick look and then we'll move off. Hi, guys. It's June's cubs. CJ wants to know how we would track animals if we didn't have dirt roads with serious difficulty, is the answer to that. Does this look like June's cubs to you? <clears throat> I wondered where they'd been hiding. Well, hang on. CJ, we would, we would have a very, very difficult time of things. If we didn't have dirt roads, we would be able to, because remember, the rest of the place is dirt as well. It's just not quite as easy. Yeah. That's where they've been hiding. All right. We're going to have to move out. Hello, you two. 
Where have you been? This here, this whole time. I, I... <coughs> Excuse me. Oh, we'll take a... Uh, no, actually, we won't. I'm sorry. We do have to move out. They're moving around a lot now. And I don't want us to be here. Okay, we can quickly. Yeah, I just want to... Sorry, Faith. I just want to move out <coughs> before they... <laughs> can't speak. What's going on? Um, I just want to move out before they come to us. It's better than... It's one of the reasons why we don't hang around while the adults are not here. But, of course, sometimes we get incredibly lucky with who's at the den, and sometimes it feels as though almost every single clan member pays a visit. Ribbon's older daughter, Ntima, certainly does not seem to share in her mother's grief and attempted isolation. In fact, she seems to have something of a gift when it comes to making those all-important social connections. For a lower-ranked hyena, that meant that she had to grin, literally, and bear the attentions of Pretty and her two cubs, as well as an excitable plonk. If Antima were a person, I would have described her as something of a social climber. She would have read all of the self-help books on making friends and influencing people. As any good social manipulator knows, nothing makes friends faster than sharing a common interest. In this case, an interesting smelling tree. Even Ribbon had to put in a show, if only for appearances. Once the tree had been dealt with, the focus point became a particularly smelly patch of ground. I have no idea what made it the perfect rolling patch for every single hyena, but it must have been something good. A nice, fresh pile of leopard scat, perhaps. I have to say that the rolling on the ground sighting was one of the cutest things I've ever seen. Every single one of the hyena present at that particular moment went, sniffed, rolled. And at one point, one of them was just scratching right down into the shoulder blades making sure it got the edge of its scapula right into this, whatever that particular smell was. And I said leopard scat just because that was the morning that Tristan was tracking a male leopard down towards the hyena den and we were about to converge. I was sitting at the den and he was slowly but surely making his way towards me. Okay, so that explains where June's cubs have been. Oh, why hasn't Ribbon moved? Oh, she might have actually. Ribbon's remaining cub might still have been in there. I, we'll have to figure that out over the next few days. Which, of course, is half the fun of new and exciting finds. I am at a loss as to how to connect that thought to Steve. I'm sure there was a way, but if there was, I failed. Off you pop across to him. Well done, Jamie, for finding whoever they are. Probably June's cubs, the original June den of close to the Hukumuri laughable sighting that you all might remember with me with my head moving like that. But anyway, Jamie, you have got your spotlight out. Maybe you can find a chameleon, the most camouflaged of them all, a very, very amazingly adapted individual that moves slowly through the trees. Camouflaged as can be. And we've got a clip prepared for you right now. We don't have to find one. We've got one already prepared for you right chair in front of us so as we push play on the iffy trees and they're quite var varied around the country but five different layers of skin the first one being transparent let me just hold it there for a second while we have a look at this chameleon stretching forward now they move very slowly through the tree and they can actually mimic the moving of leaves but five layers of skin the first being transparent the second one being a xanthophores which is gives them a yellow pigment um, 
part of the chromatophore sort of variety. We've also got the erythrophores, which give a red pigment, and then iridophores, which are iridescent cells, which help to reflect the light, as well as melanophores, which give the melanin and sort of protection against the sun. So with those five different layers, it gives a variety of different colors and adaptions for moving in and out of the color spectrum for their camouflage. And some people say it's pheromonal, it's, um, there's a chemical re respondent inside there, but a chameleon changes between white, green, and black, depending on mood. And exactly how that works, it's very hard to understand. But if a chameleon gets a little bit angry, they go quite dark. And if it's very, very sunny, they go quite white. And obviously, being in the trees, being as camouflaged as they can, very, very slow moving. We spoke about the body shape and the outline. They're about as well adapted into the trees as can possibly be with that very slow movement. The eyes have the ability to move. Let's keep watching. Keep moving in each direction with a prehensile tail, very well adapted feet for climbing, and obviously the stealth ambush predator supreme on the African continent, and no doubt there are many other chameleon species around the world. So that is the highlight for the afternoon from a camouflage point of view. There is no better camouflage creature that I can say on land that than the chameleon. So it's very, very cool. So I promised you all earlier we would talk a little bit about the cheetah and their camouflage. So I'm just going to quickly find you a nice photograph here on the um, spreadsheet, not the spreadsheet, but um, on my PowerPoint. And we all know this picture here, don't we? I'll show you this picture. We all know who this guy is, don't we? And we talk about camouflage. We also talk about avoiding confrontation. And these colors on the honey badger are black and white which are basically indicating an aposomatic or warning coloration to nocturnal animals and a leave me alone if you value your life sort of behavior. And the honey badger lives up to his reputation. They do have anal glands, they do have scent they give off, but for anything, it's mainly the, just the ferociousness and tenacity of them that everybody goes, oh, I'm gonna leave you alone. So you ready for the next picture? It's not the clearest of pictures, but you all know what honey badger looks like. So let's go back to the next picture. Have a look at that. So before I answer your question Ian about who struggles to camouflage themselves, have a look at what baby cheetahs look like. Baby cheetahs have this long blonde fur or white fur on their back and the bottom of their body is a lot darker. And under right conditions, uh, if for example some predators may be threatening the baby cheetah, they can snarl and they can spit and an animal's gonna go, whoa, hang on, I've dealt with this before and they're just gonna leave immediately. So it's not a form of camouflage, it's a form of mimicry to say, watch out. So mimicry means you are mimicking the, or you're pretending to be something that you're not. So either you have a chemical defense or you have some sort of poison or some form of distasteful, whatever it might be, or you are a honey badger who's just going to beat you up and never leave you alone. So <laughs> that is, that is the story of the cheetah doing its thing. And Ian wants to know what animals struggle to camouflage. I don't really know. Most animals have some way of blending into the environment. Um, it seems to only be humans who walk around in brightly colored clothing. Uh, we really do always insist when you're walking in the bush that you wear neutral colored clothing to blend in so we don't influence the animals. So probably the worst in the world are probably humans with our taste of fashion. And Senzo working at Wild Earth is probably the least uh, well camouflaged human being because he is the most colorfully dressed for the most part day in and day out. But uh, before we end, um, we can't end a show like this without talking a little bit about the adaptations of certain birds and certain reptiles as well. And I'm just going to jump on the screen one more time to show you a couple lizards and a gama. Um, on the top we have got what looks like a rockagama female and then the blue head underneath is the tree agama with the blue head and that's a male who is basically advertising his reproductivity. So the females want to be invisible and the males in the non-breeding season are invisible but when they want to breed they highlight themselves by saying look at me. If the females can see them 
the predators can see them, so they give away a little bit of their camouflage so as to advertise to the females how strong they are. The bird can't catch me, the snake can't catch me, I'm too quick, you want to breed with me. So some animals will actually go past their camouflage. Many of these birds we see, the long-tailed widers, the wood birds, they come into breeding plumage that's very obvious and very difficult to sort of handle from a camouflage point of view with the benefit of breeding and reproduction. Because if you have a look on the right hand side of this picture, there is a tree agama in the screen towards the bottom third. And you'll see how well camouflaged it is actually on the screen over there. And that is how they survive. Because they are predatory, they will feed mainly on ants and maybe even termites as they move around, but they want to avoid being seen by birds that would very easily snap them up and eat them. But as I push play there once again, we've got to talk about birds for now and again. Uh, ground nesting birds you can see on the bottom of the screen. We've got some camouflaged birds and their eggs on the ground are completely invisible. So before we end the show, we'll have a look at some what look like plover eggs on the ground, some lapwing eggs, very camouflaged on the bottom left. Uh, the guinea fowl being as camouflaged as they are actually hide their, their eggs inside of a bush and the Birchall's kukul on the right there, very, very hidden inside the bush. And then finally, oopsie, I've gone the wrong way. I'm sorry, I've gone the wrong way. Oh, that is how it works, everybody. It was all planned, it was all prepared, and my eggs, I had some very nice bird pictures that have now disappeared, but some of the birds even camouflage their eggs or not just the eggs, but the nests as well. The flycatchers actually stick uh, lichen on the side, and those nests are so well camouflaged up in the tree. But um, that is a talk again for another day. It has been a wonderful afternoon of camouflage. Uh, Senzo has been wearing a camouflage hat the whole afternoon. That's why you haven't been able to see him. Um, but with finding the little chief out on safari, what a wonderful time we've had. And wouldn't it be nice if little Columba manages to materialize tomorrow? Uh, Jamie was very excited to finding herself some of the Juma clan who once again were following Hassan, and that's how Pat found them, just as Tristan detailed. The stinky hyenas are very happy that the little chief is back. Maybe not as happy as many of you out there, but I know Senza, myself, everybody else on the Wild Earth team is very happy that the little chief is back with his camouflage at his favorite pans. He is back. Hopefully he's here to stay. He's definitely here for the winter months, but uh, that was also the highlight of this pre previous week. And of course, the wild dog sighting that I had last week, the best sighting probably of my life. And poor Waterbuck wasn't camouflaged enough didn't survive. But everybody, thank you for joining us this afternoon on Safari Lives. We hope you enjoyed it. We'll see you again tomorrow morning for another Sunrise Safari. Have a good evening, good night, goodbye. Thank you.